Hello and welcome to the first video in the series. My name is John Kutzmita. I'm the CEO and owner of bestmortgagerate.com. We're also serving veterans as no-cost VA loans.com. I'm putting together this video series because there's a lot of things that are probably going to be unfolding in 2019, as well as towards the end here of 2018 in particular. The Federal Reserve has an FOMC meeting at the end of this month, actually right in the middle on the 18th and 19th. And they will be announcing most likely another increase to the Fed funds rate, most, most likely taking it another quarter percent higher to two and a quarter to, to two and a half percent. Uh, what that ultimately means for mortgage rates is actually quite different. So in this first video, we're gonna go over a report that I wrote called The Truth About Mortgage Rates. Now you can download this from the website. It looks like this. And so I'm more or less going to be doing what is very much like an audiobook reading. I'm going to be going through the report with you and then breaking off and diving into deeper details about some of the topics covered in the report. So some of this information is dense. I understand that. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this reading is I feel like some people, even if I give this to them, won't take the time to read it. If they do take the time to read it, they might not understand it. They might not be able to digest it. So what we're doing here is giving you a little bit more opportunity to soak this information in because it is very important. This isn't something you can just stick your head in the sand about and ignore. If you're watching this, perhaps you own a home, perhaps you're thinking about buying a home, if you fall into any one of those categories, or even if you're a real estate investor, you need to know this information. This is critical, this is how money works. This is the cost, the price of money, at least in the current modern era of finance. So this is critical for you to understand. I'm trying to make it more palatable. Hopefully I succeed in that mission. So let's get started. Again, the first report that we're gonna go through in the first video in this series of videos is the truth about mortgage interest rates. Diving right in to the first section, which is entitled the Fed funds rate. This is actually what they're talking about raising potentially here in about a week or so. So the Fed funds rate, the Federal Reserve Bank, also referred to as the Fed, is the US Central Bank. The objective of the Fed, established by Congress in the Federal Reserve Act of 1977, is to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. This is known as their dual mandate and also includes the task of trying to moderate long-term interest rates. However, when you hear that the Fed is raising interest rates, that is actually referring to the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate is the overnight lending rate for depository institutions such as banks and credit unions that lend to each other and at times borrow from the Federal Reserve in order to meet liquidity and reserve requirements. Think of it as the benchmark rate at which friends lend money to each other for a short duration or length of time without any collateral or anything backing it. For example, hey Jim, can I borrow 10 bucks? I'm a little short on cash. Sure Joe, pay me back tomorrow is more or less what the banks are doing with one another when they're using the Fed funds rate as the interest rate for that overnight lending. Thus, when you hear someone say the Fed is raising interest rates, they are actually talking about the Fed funds rate, and it is important for you to understand that this does not go across all interest rates. Just because the Fed is raising the Fed funds rate does not mean every single interest rate on planet Earth is also going to go up. And as we will discuss in this reading and in this report, the opposite tends to be true for mortgage interest rates, especially when the Federal Reserve has been on what is called a rate hiking cycle, which is really just consistently raising rates over a short period of time. When the Fed does that, it eventually causes or leads the economy into a recession, which tends to be good for mortgage interest rates. And we're gonna dive into that. This is also something I've been talking about for well over a year and is now starting to come to fruition. And it's very likely that the Fed does what the Fed has always done historically, which is raise too quickly over a short period of time they cause an inverted yield curve, which we'll talk about more, eventually call it ca causing a contraction in the credit markets and in the economy leading to recession. So again, we'll get into all of this in this reading. It's important for you to understand this information for that reason. We may be headed into tough times ahead and you need to prepare yourself accordingly. So now back to the report, the Fed funds is an important rate, but in the context of recent market conditions, it has been mostly symbolic. To use the word recent is a bit ambiguous, but implies the last seven years of ZERP, ZERP meaning zero interest rate policy, during which time the Fed held the rate at the Fed funds at 
The Federal Reserve Bank finally raised the Fed funds rate above zero December 16th, 2015. However, they didn't raise again until a year later. So they're really, really slow about this, this rate hiking cycle because the economy, despite what you hear and perhaps despite what you think, is still relatively weak. So as illustrated by the blue line in the chart on the left, and as of August 2017, the Fed has raised rates three more times to the current rate of one to one and a quarter. And again, like I said, it is very likely uh, a few days from now, a week from now, that the Federal Reserve will raise the Fed funds rate one more time to the range of two and a quarter and two and a half percent. It's getting a little dicey for them. They're probably going to start slowing things down. But in my opinion, it's already too late. They've risen too much too quickly and things are already baked into the cake. Most likely we're headed into recession in 2019. This emerging rate hiking cycle is the first step towards normalization or levels that more closely reflect historic averages. Given that the current economic expansion is one of the longest on record, the probability of a market correction is increasing with every passing quarter. Thus, the eagerness from the Fed to move off the zero bound, ZERP, probably has less to do with normalization and more to do with reloading their gun, so they have the ability to once again lower rates in the future should another financial crisis present itself. So I originally wrote this report some years ago, right around uh, the end of 2016, the beginning of 2017, and they were just beginning their rate hiking cycle. And really the argument still stands as it, does, as it did back then, which is the Fed isn't raising interest rates necessarily because it feels like the economy is healed and things are good and it's trying to get ahead of inflation. It's more so aware of the factors that are going on in terms of how late we are into this recovery, the cyclical nature of markets, and that eventually we are going to have a contraction, potentially a recession, and the Federal Reserve, from a mon monetary policy standpoint, based on their dual mandate, is going to want to be as prepared as possible to handle that. And the first step is to cut interest rates. You can't cut interest rates at zero, so they're trying to raise as quickly as they can so they can get themselves back to a point where they have some leverage, at least they have a lever to pull on and they can cut from somewhere. So hey, if they raise again another quarter percent to two and a quarter and two and a half percent, again, not a ton of room, but it's a heck of a lot better than being at zero. And this has basically been their objective over the last two years. So moving on to the next page, which is a new section, the bond market. So the relationship between bonds and mortgage rates is critical to understand, but first a basic knowledge of bonds is required. In general, bonds are an investment in debt. When you purchase a bond, you are typically lending money to an institution or government that issues the bond. Therefore, a bond market, sometimes referred to as a credit market, is made up of creditors, which are the investors, and debtors, which are the borrowers. Currently, the global bond market exceeds 100 trillion in debt issuance, and in the past 15 years, has more than tripled in size. This current credit expansion has been considered by many as the last breath of a long-term debt super cycle. The super cycle trend can last decades, even multiple generations, and is then punctuated by a dramatic shift in the opposite direction. Given the length of the current debt super cycle, it has been suggested that a collapse in the credit markets may be forthcoming. And again, I wrote this in the beginning of 2017, started putting it together at the end of 2016, and these were topics that were, we were discussing then and considering then, and things have just gotten even in more extreme in terms of the debt creation and the intense leverage the entire economy currently has. What this means is if we do experience a contraction, if we are at the end of a debt super cycle, the cleansing of all of that excess credit is going to be very, very painful. So this is something, again, just to repeat myself, we need to take seriously. We need to be prepared for it. We need to be in a position to navigate should things change course than what we've been used to the past couple of decades, especially the last six or seven years. Back to the report. The U.S. bond market alone exceeds $40 trillion and is considered to be the deepest and most liquid market. This means that on just about any given day in the majority of market conditions, there is a buyer for every seller. Thus, a bond trade or exchange can be made with limited volatility and impact on price. Despite unsustainable levels, U.S. government debt is considered by most market participants to be the world's safest asset. This is partly because the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency and the U.S. is still the world's largest econ economy. This provides certain privileges, whereas the market seems to simply forgive this, the fiscal profligacy 
of our government, allowing it to continue to expand the national debt to the highest levels of any government in the history of the world. Yet even at these extremes, a U.S. default is considered unlikely, since U.S. Treasury can issue more debt to pay excuse me. Even at these extremes, a U.S. default is considered unlikely since U.S. Treasury can issue more debt to pay current government liabilities. So this is a really important paragraph or section here. This is on page four. Basically, because the U.S. is still the world's largest economy, it's still the reserve currency, most transactions, especially in the global markets, still need to clear or, or trade in U.S. dollars, which means there's a high demand for U.S. dollars. And more or less what equivalent to U.S. dollars can be in the credit markets is U.S. treasuries. So there is a high demand for U.S. treasuries, even though the solvency of the U.S. government is questionable because of the size of debt. So we kind of have these um, advantages in our favor that allow us to continue to expand the national debt, um, spend foolishly. And that's kind of what the profligacy means. It's, it's meaning that there's, there's really no punishment or consequence for this um, inappropriate and um, less, less than frugal behavior from the government, from politicians. So this is something for us to keep a close eye on, but at the end of the day, the other factor, in addition to reserve currency and the world's largest economy, is that, and this is somewhat true in other economies as well, like Japan, but if there was any kind of issue where there wasn't enough demand to buy those U.S. treasuries, which would ultimately cause interest rates on government debt to rise, which we'll talk about shortly. But if there is a lack of um, buyers or lack of demand for US government debt, the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, which is a privately held bank, by the way, it's neither federal nor actually any kind of uh, true banking institution, but let's focus on the topic here for now. Point is, the Federal Reserve, should there be a lack of demand for US government bonds, could ultimately just buy those bonds out of thin air, or excuse me, out of money printed out of thin air, which is called monetizing the debt. This is something the, um, the, uh, the country of Japan has been doing for quite some time. They've been ba buying these JGBs. Um, the Bank of Japan, the BOJ, has basically been monetizing the entire, um, the entire debt load of, of uh, the Japan government. So it's certainly something that can happen here in the U.S. And kind of when you look at historic trends, or at least um, kind of the patterns that have been forming, the U.S. is more or less uh, a decade or two behind Japan in terms of certain monetary policies, certain demographic factors, which led to the, the Japanese um, economy to, to crumble some 30 years ago. It used to be called the lost decade in Japan. Shoot, now it's been basically three decades of just this papering over the credit disasters of the past and having the central bank bail out the government. Um, so it's very possible we see the same thing happen in, in the United States in terms of timelines that we're experiencing that Japan experienced previously. So um, this ultimately would mean you know, a, a much weaker dollar and a diluted currency. And this really hurts uh, everybody in the U.S. economy. This is partly an argument for um, hard assets like real estate, if it's cash flowing income producing, and other things like precious metals such as gold and silver. So going back to the report, page five now, uh, we're talking about the, um, the, the Federal Reserve basically buying government debt or monetizing the debt. And on page five, we start with, this is the equivalent of paying your bills with a credit card. It is also the basis for the reoccurring debate over raising the total debt allowed by federal law known as the debt ceiling. So the government can only issue so much debt as allowed by law, allowed by Congress. This debates, the, excuse me, this uh, debt ceiling debate has been going on constantly now for a number of years. And of course, they always raise the debt ceiling because if they don't, then the government's not going to have the money to pay their bills, keep the lights on. And there's bigger issues afoot there in terms of politicians getting reelected and, and really just the overall uh, stability of the economy. But with that being said, the debt ceiling has once again resurfaced as a hot topic uh, Trump wants to, you know, build the border security, build the wall, um, and different sides of government can't really agree on, on what needs to be cut, or if nothing gets cut, whether or not we can raise the debt ceiling. So this ultimately leads to a potential government shutdown, which he's threatened to do um, by the end of next week, um, really the middle of the month. So we'll see how that transpires. These types of risk factors do cause 
turbulence in the market, especially in the stock market. And that type of turbulence can be good for the bond market, which ultimately could be good, um, quite very good for mortgage interest rates, which we're going to get to here just shortly. So back to the report, even if there were no buyers for the newly issued bonds, the debt could be monetized by the central bank with the money that is created out of thin air. This provides liquidity to the financial system, but also devalues the currency. The Federal Reserve is actually a privately held bank with the power to print money in exchange for U.S. government bonds. The interest on those bonds is then paid for from the income taxes collected on the U.S. citizen. Therefore, as a result of the Federal Reserve Act of 1977, Congress has enslaved future generations by handing over control of our monetary system to a privately held banking syndicate. Good job, fellas. This is such an important topic to understand that all money is basically debt, and really the, the puppeteers of that debt creation um, are these central banks, which have the authority to print money out of thin air. And really what they're doing, they're acquiring government bonds, which is debt, um, at the expense of income tax. So really the only reason the income tax exists is to pay government debt. Um, and so it's a, a, a great misnomenclature to believe that your income taxes are necessary to pay for subsidies and, and all the things that you enjoy in terms of the, the public sector like parks and, and police and, and firemen. This simply isn't true. Uh, if the government had the ability to issue its own currency, which it used to, uh, we could just simply pay for those things um, ourselves and print the money ourselves. But because of this Federal Reserve Act, it's now um, something that ultimately becomes a debt burden. Such a powerful topic, such an important one to understand. Not enough time to get into it, but that's something you want to learn more about. Please leave a comment, um, leave some feedback, or send me an email, and perhaps I can do a video just on the Federal Reserve um, and really what's going on there in a future video. So moving back to the report, the idea that money is debt escapes most people. However, what should be understood is that without a comprehensive plan to reduce government expenditures, higher taxes are likely in order to manage the debt at current levels. The other option is inflation, which is ultimately a tax on the purchasing power of a currency. I believe we're going to see both. Um, this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm a little nervous about certain markets and real estate in those markets, because real property is one of the easiest things for governments to tax. And what they're going to end up doing, especially governments that are dead broke, like Illinois, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, California, these, these states um, have pension funds that are heavily underfunded, meaning there's not enough money to actually pay the pensioners. These people have retired, work for the state, and they're expecting you know, a pension. There's no money there. Um, in addition to that, there's another, a number of other things that are underfunded, and the state as a whole is basically looking at going into bankruptcy. This has already happened in areas like Detroit, so this isn't something I'm making up. You can do your own research and see that these types of things, default on um, pensions and whatnot, is already underway. And so, um, you know, as, as a matter of controlling this or eventually paying these things, there's two things that are going to happen. They're either going to inflate the debt away, which is really um, just diminishing the purchasing power of the currency. And we've, we've consistently seen this over, over history as the way for governments to kind of eat their way out of the debt load that they create. The other option um, basically is to increase taxes. This is a constant debate between both sides of government. Um, you know, Trump did a recent tax reform and cut taxes in certain ways. In order to do that, they actually had to cut spending. So it was really a balancing out of things. It wasn't necessarily a reduction in, in government spending. So you either need a reduction in government spending, which good luck, I doubt that's ever going to happen. You're either going to need inflation to kind of inflate the debt away, or you're going to have to increase taxes to pay for the debt. The, the final and worst case scenario is the government just defaults, which is something countries like Argentina have been doing historically over the past 30 to 40 years. Um, back to the report, new section, investing in bonds. Because of how bonds are structured, they are considered fixed income investments. This means that interest income or yield is paid out on a fixed schedule. Therefore, bonds can provide a guaranteed income stream or cash flow on a regular basis. This type of investment tends to be most attractive for investors when riskier assets such as stocks are experiencing higher than usual volatility or are declining in value, which has been starting um, so far at the end of November, beginning of December. We're seeing a lot of pressure in the stock market. It's not a perfect correlation. Historically, they don't run in parallel. 
um, or even in, in a perfect inversion, but basically when you see um, uncertainty and volatility, excuse me, volatility in the marketplace, investors tend to move out of riskier assets and into so-called safer assets like bonds. In addition, investors who are risk adverse require a stable income stream, such as retirees, prefer bonds as a means to generate a safe return while limiting the risk of a principal loss. More simply put, bonds provide a safe place to park money during periods of high volatility. Thus, investing in bonds is often called the safe haven trade. Next page, page six, the inverse relationship of bonds. There is one more aspect of bonds we need to discuss, and that is the inverse relationship between the price of bond and its yield. The yield rate of return from a bond and an actual bond coupon rate can be different. The coupon rate is the periodic rate of interest a bond will generate when it is purchased at face value, sometimes called par, and held to maturity. However, the more an investor pays above the face value of the bond, the lower the yield. The interest rate or the coupon on that bond is what it is. When that bond is issued, it's going to pay you, say, 5%. If it's a $100 bond issuing 5% interest and you pay $100, you're getting a 5% return on your money. If you pay more for that $100 bond, say you pay $105, I won't get into why you might do that, but per se, you do, then although the coupon is still 5% or what that bond is paying every month is still 5% of the original face value, because you paid more for it, the yield or rate of return on that is actually less than the coupon rate. Um, bond mathematics and bond investing in general is, is not supposed to be a, uh, a simple topic. It can get uh, complex and convoluted, but just try to understand this, this simple or general relationship of the price of a bond is inverse the yield. As the price of the bond goes up, the rate of return or yield you're getting on that bond goes down and vice versa. If you buy a bond below its face value, then the return that you're getting is actually higher than the, than the coupon rate. So price and yield inverse, keep that in mind. So there's a um, infographic in the report that kind of hopefully helps visualize this a little more, but it's really just as simple for now as price goes up, you know, rate slash yield goes down and vice versa. If interest rate is going up, price of the bond is going down. So you gotta look at things from the uh, perspective of the bond investor. The example above does not reflect other factors such as inflation, which, which can also impact the value of a bond. When additional criteria are considered, bond math can get much more complicated than what is being il illustrated. However, the inverse relationship between price and yield is still a core premise to keep in mind as we further discuss bonds and mortgage interest rates. Up next, we discuss the important relationship between mortgage bonds and mortgage rates. Page seven, new section, mortgage bonds and mortgage rates. Now that we've covered some basic concepts of the bond market, we can begin to focus more specifically on mortgage bonds and the impact they have on mortgage rates. The fin in, excuse me, in finance, the term security is very general and can refer to most any tradable financial asset, including both stocks and bonds. An asset-backed security is a bit more specific and has the name, as the name suggests, is usually backed by some type of collateral or asset. In the case of a mortgage-backed security, the collateral is securitized mortgage loans and their underlying real estate. Mortgage-backed securities are also referred to as MBS and are the backbone of mortgage bonds. Collateral, your security or your asset or your investment backing your investment, is a security, this uh, securitized bundle or this package of mortgages that have been pulled together and and pulled together as a, as a, as a, like I said, as a bundle and security. And this is giving more um, peace of mind to the bond investor or the investor in general, someone who likes the idea of lending money to uh, homeowners or, or using real estate as the collateral. It's riskier to say, lend someone a million dollars, one person a million dollars and hope that they don't default. However, if you invest a million dollars into a mortgage-backed security and you have a mortgage bond collateralized by a number of different mortgages or, or um, mortgagee people who are paying their mortgage, if one of those individuals happens to go in default or is late on their payment, it's less likely to have an impact or a big impact on the investor since their money is spread, spread across 
uh, multiple mortgages. And that's more or less what a mortgage-backed security, this this collateral or this um, this bundle of mortgages is, and, and the purpose of it. It is an oversimplification, but mortgage loans with similar characteristics, such as interest rate, are packaged and securitized into MBS. Then mortgage bonds are issued from these securities and the receivables collected on mortgage payments are distributed to the bond investors. You may recall when the price of a bond increases, the yield decreases. This inverse relationship between price and yield also holds true for mortgage bonds. When the price of a bond increases above its face value, the investor is choosing to pay more for the same fixed amount of cash flow. Paying a premium above the face value of a bond reduces the yield of that bond, even though the original coupon rate does not change. And I talked about this a moment ago, just kind of reiterating it in the report, and I'll read that again because it is important. Paying a premium above the face value of a bond reduces the yield of that bond, even though the original coupon rate does not change. When bond prices rise, mortgage rate, excuse me, when bond prices rise, mortgage companies advertise lower rates. Since the increase and investor premiums, or what investors are willing to pay, help to offset loan cost. Fundamentally, mortgage rates do not actually fall. Bonds simply become more expensive and thereby lower interest rates more affordable as a result of investor premiums being applied to loan fees. Let's talk about this because this, uh, this is everything right here in terms of you as a homeowner, real estate investors trying to get the most out of your mortgage loan, navigating the bond market, trying to leverage this information to get your best possible deal, your lowest mortgage rate at the best possible price. Well, when it comes to what I just mentioned here in this report, the idea is at any given moment, any given interest rate is in theory available to you, but more or less where the investment market is willing to pay the par price for a particular interest rate fluctuates daily. So if investors are looking for a higher rate, and you're looking and you want something lower than that, than that par rate, then ultimately you're going to be the one incentivizing the investment market to take less interest every month and you have to pay a premium. Some people refer to that as paying points. Uh, it's actually called a discount fee, but let's focus on the topic here. The idea is any interest rates in theory available to you. It's just how much are you willing to pay based on what the market in that given moment is willing to take. So as investors begin to buy more bonds for any number of reasons, such as there's risk in the market and they want to protect themselves and they're, they're doing the safe haven trade of buying bonds, well, if they're in that mindset, more and more people are going to be competing for the same asset, the bond. Law of supply and demand is more people are paying to buy that particular bond, the price of that bond, the competition around that bond is going to go up. So as the price goes up, there's more money chasing that same coupon rate and, and investors are paying a premium. They're paying money above the price of that coupon or above the par price, the value of the bond. That premium is something that ultimately can get passed on to you as the borrower, as the homeowner to help make a lower interest rate or that given interest rate less expensive for you. It's so important to understand that mortgage interest rates are not like credit cards, okay? A low rate doesn't necessarily mean a better loan, okay? When you get a credit card in the mail, all you have to do is rip it open, activate it, and you go off and go spend. Well, the lower the rate on that credit card, the better it is for you. When it comes to the mortgage market, because you have these different dynamics, such as the bond market, investor premiums, par rate, things that fluctuate daily, it's not as simple as just signing up for a mortgage loan. There's also third-party fees you have to consider and really what the market is willing to take as an interest rate on that given day, and whether or not that rate is going to pay you premium, incentivize you to take that higher rate, or if you're gonna to have to incentivize the market, pay a premium to the market to get a lower rate. So between the combination of the rate that you want, what you're willing to pay given what the market is, is expecting in that, in that given moment, and all the other settlement fees and closing costs you need to consider, just focusing on lower rate doesn't mean better loan. This is much easier to, to describe one-on-one -on -one when I put together a scenario that's based on uh, a person's particular objectives. So if you want to dive into this more, if you want to learn more about this, and you want to see 
how we prepare strategic refinance plans and strategic mortgage plans for our clients so that they can take advantage of these different dynamics in the mortgage bond market and in the mortgage interest rate market, as well as how we use those dynamics to forecast where we see interest rates going. If you're interested in, in this type of information and seeing it put together for you personally, please leave a comment, better yet, send me a direct message um, and request that information, I'd be more than happy to help. So that was a pretty long-winded uh, diatribe there going into these premiums and how um, interest rates on mortgages are not as simple as just low rate means better loan. And certainly this idea of higher bond price means uh, lower interest rates for you. Really, it just means less money to get a lower interest rate. So there's a summary for you. Um, back to the report, last paragraph on page seven. When bond prices rise, mortgage companies advertise lower rates since the increased investor premiums help to offset loan costs. Fundamentally, mortgage rates do not actually fall. Bonds simply become more expensive and thereby lower rates more affordable as a result of investor premiums being applied to loan fees. The opposite is true when bonds are less favorable. As the bond price falls, the cost for lower rates is transferred to the borrower. This is often referred to as paying points, but is more accurately called a discount fee. Think of it as the investor getting the bond for less or at a discount. This would then equate to a higher yield rate of return for the investor. Next page, page eight. As previously discussed, bonds are referred to as a safe haven trade. Therefore, investors will typically look to the bond market in order to minimize risk. Although this risk off, risk on relationship between bonds, which are considered risk off, and more volatile investments like stocks, which are considered risk on, is not always perfect, the general theme will help you better understand the context of how we are able to make predictions about mortgage rates. While continuing to explore the relationship between bonds and mortgage interest rates, keep in mind the law of supply and demand. The more demand there is for bonds, the higher the price. In a risk-off environment, more investors will be seeking the safety of bonds. The increased demand will push the price higher and bond yields lower. The same would apply to mortgage bonds. While this dynamic has many implications, a key takeaway is that as markets become more risky and the demand for bonds grow, there is a greater likelihood for lower mortgage interest rates. Perhaps a more simple way in which to summarize this concept is to state that an increase in risk in the markets equals lower mortgage interest rates. And this is probably one of the most important reasons for us sharing this information or at least consolidating it and bringing your attention to it and, and hopefully putting it together in a form where you can digest this in some way or another that works for you. Because right now, We've enjoyed a long run, a long recovery, if you want to call it a recovery, but basically things like stocks have been increasing in value for a steady period of time, and more or less, we feel that the party is over. And so you're going to start to see risk and volatility creep its way back into the marketplace. And as a result, investors are going to look for a safer place to park their money um, versus high yield junk bonds versus the riskier um, elements of the stock market. And they're going to be looking to put their money in the, in the safe haven of the treasury bond market and the mortgage backed security bond market, which as a result is going to mean lower mortgage rates and lower mortgage rates for you at a much lower cost. So you need to be positioned for this. You need to be ready to take advantage of this. And certainly turmoil in the marketplace isn't necessarily a good thing. And it may have some downward pressure on home values, something else you need to keep in mind that we may have seen the peak in housing. So I know that's probably something you don't want to hear, but I, I'm here to give you uh, the, the facts, the reality, even if it's a little tough to swallow, we probably hit the highs in the housing market um, quite potentially for the foreseeable future. So keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that we're gonna suddenly have a crash, but um, lower mortgage rates will certainly help keep um, the home market stable, we hope but these are all things that you need to kind of uh, have a plan to handle should things get a little more chaotic than expected. Okay, moving on, page nine, the junk bond market. In addition to government and mortgage bonds, investors will diversify across different classes of bonds, such as corporate bonds, but not all bonds are considered safe. Some bonds are actually referred to as junk bonds and usually offer a higher yield to investors because of the greater risk for default. As an example, most of the debt issued by companies which operate in the oil fracking industry are considered junk. 
This is because the success rate of these types of enterprises is very low and is also very sensitive to the fluctuation in oil prices. Because of the increased risk to the investor, many of these businesses will need to pay higher interest on their bonds. This is why they are also referred to as high yield bonds. However, due to ZERP, which is a zero interest rate policy of the Federal Reserve, and the low interest rate policies from central banks around the world, investors have been forced into more risky assets like junk bonds in order to generate expected returns. This is also a scary factor because you've had a lot of institutions that are managing money, managing pension funds, insurance companies, etc., that because of the suppression of interest rates caused by the Federal Reserve's manipulating in the marketplace and a number of other factors, you've had people go further out on the risk curve, which basically just means chasing um, return or yield by doing riskier stuff. Uh, we've seen institutions that don't normally do this forced to do it in order to generate enough of a consistent income stream to keep paying claims on insurances, keep paying pensions, uh, life insurance, etc. So once that market starts to unravel, should there be some sort of string of defaults, um, which potentially looks like it, the likelihood of that is increasing due to the fact that oil prices have started to decline rapidly. This puts uh, businesses that are, have a very thin margin for profit in the oil business, such as those who are in the fracking industry, it puts them under a lot of pressure because now the oil prices are dropping, they're not making enough money. In addition, a lot of these companies borrow for short-term duration, meaning they maybe do a one-year, two-year, three-year type of um, bond or issuance of debt to fund their enterprise. A lot of that, um, a lot of that debt that was issued uh, or a lot of the bonds issued by companies in the oil fracking business um, are now coming due. And typically what a company will do at that point is go back to the bond market, issue new debt, and take the money from that new debt to pay off the old debt and more or less just roll over the debt. Well, that becomes a, a difficult endeavor to do while still remaining profitable The short-term interest rates are rising, meaning when you go to the, the debt markets or when you issue uh, a new bond to pay off the old bond, it's going to be at a higher interest rate, which again hurts profits. And this is something that is impacted by the Federal Reserve raising the Fed funds rate, because the Fed funds rate, remember, is an overnight lending rate. It's a short-term, uh, it's, sh it's short-term lending. So other types of, uh, how do I say, um, products or investment vehicles or, or debt instruments um, that are also short term are going to be impacted when the Federal Reserve is raising the Fed funds rate. The opposite is true for long duration bonds and mortgage backed security bonds, which tend to be uh, for longer periods of time when short term rates uh, are being risen rapidly or when the Fed is in a rate hiking cycle like they are now, the long end of the curve or long duration bonds, which are more the safe haven aspect of the bond market tend to go up in price and, and interest rates tend to go down. So this dynamic of the Federal Reserve raising interest rates after keeping rates so low for so long um, has put a lot of risky companies in jeopardy of going bankrupt and really most of these companies should have went bankrupt already. It's just a matter of fact that they've been able to stay alive because money was so cheap. Now that that dynamic is changing, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the junk bond market and the high yield market, um, many investors are expecting there to be um, some serious problems and, and, and certain companies to basically go bankrupt and, and close their doors. So important that we keep an eye on the junk bond market. It may be what we refer to as the canary in the coal mine or basically the first sign of trouble. Uh, moving on to the next section, interpreting the bond market. While usually providing a safe haven, bonds can act as a barometer for market conditions and how investors feel about the economy. For example, lower bond yields suggest that market sentiment is negative or bearish, since more investors are reducing risk by investing in bonds. However, if the general market sentiment is bullish or optimistic about the future, then investors will be more likely to sell bonds. There are any number of factors which can influence market sentiment, thus impacting the price of bonds and vice versa. The unexpected results of the U.S. election is a perfect example, but a quarterly GDP report or a noteworthy change in the monthly unemployment rate can be just as influential. In addition, economic growth can cause inflation and an increase in the price of certain goods or services. This also erodes the value of money and is typically a catalyst for higher interest rates. 
Therefore, inflation is referred to as being bond unfriendly since higher rates also means falling bond prices. As a result, certain market conditions, which may be good for the overall economy, are actually considered bearish for bonds. This ties back into the theme that an increase of risk in the markets equals lower mortgage rates, or in the case of an improving economy, the potential decrease of risk in the market likely means higher mortgage rates, which is more or less what we had the last two years. Trump was elected, there was this euphoria, there was what was referred to as the animal spirits returning, that everything was gonna be great. Uh, we've got this business-friendly president now. He's gonna do things that are gonna help the economy grow. He's gonna cut taxes. He's gonna do infrastructure spending, which is gonna help the economy boom again. And so overall, uh, market participants kind of did what we would say front run that um, anticipation, right? They, they, they jumped out, they bought stocks on the anticipation or the expectation that um, the Trump administration was going to do all these things to stimulate growth again. And so as part of that, or as part of the, um, the sentiment that there's going to be growth and, and, and further economic expansion, investors will sell out of bonds and, and try to capitalize on the potential for their short-term profits by buying things like stocks. So it's one of the reasons we, we saw interest rates shoot up over the past two years shortly after Trump was elected. It had more to do with this sentiment or the animal spirits of, of, of where um, people expected or had hoped Trump would ultimately be able to take the economy. But I think there was far too many headwinds um, already in place before Trump was even elected for him to really make any meaningful long-term change. And so once the excitement of all of that ran its course, it was only inevitable that we would start to see some of the things we're seeing right now, which is a bit of reality setting back in people taking some of their money out of those risk assets back into bonds, and we're starting to see interest rates balance out and um, at the same time start to come down um, and decline, which is obviously favorable for anybody who's, who's looking to capitalize on a, a lower uh, mortgage rate. So moving on to page 10, the 10-year U.S. Treasury bond is considered the benchmark for most bonds in the United States and is therefore more closely monitored by the market as a proxy for investor sentiment. Because mortgage bonds offer a similar type of risk-off investment, they tend to closely mirror the path of U.S. Treasuries. By assessing global market conditions and the impact they might have on an investor sentiment, we can start to build a case for which direction bond yields and thus mortgage interest rates might be headed in the future. Next section, technical analysis. The trading methodology of technical analysis analyzes market data usually in the form of a line graph with the purpose of determining if a familiar pattern, trend, or other relationship exists. An investor who uses technical analysis is often referred to as a chartist and will formulate market opinions by identifying certain patterns within a chart or series of charts. One of the most famous chart patterns that's somehow frequently overlooked by investors is associated with market bubbles and is characterized by a mania phase where prices increase rapidly in a short period of time. On this page 10, you'll see a picture of the classic mania cycle, what it looks like when a bubble is forming and a bubble pops and then there's this blow off top and then capitulation and the market comes crashing down. Um, it's, a, it's happened over and over and over. We just saw it happen with Bitcoin, um, which was such a, a screaming example of a bubble yet it still sucks people in because there's so much um, emotional mania behind it. Yet, we saw it happen in the dot-com, the housing market, and now we're seeing it again here in 2018, where just about every asset class is in some form of a bubble. It is quite frightening when you really step back and you look at it, because historically all bubbles end the same way. So this is true for the stock market, this is true for housing, this is true even for car loans, auto loans, uh, the automobile industry, uh, student loans, uh, colleges. It's, it's you know, it's something that's discussed in, um, in the markets of, of how one of the biggest bubbles of all time is, is the university system and, and this um, facade of college education and the indebtedness that people have taken on to chase that, um, which is also following, you know, classical chart patterns for a bubble. So right now it's, it's been coined or nicknamed the everything bubble because it's not just housing, it's not just tech stocks, it's not just things like Bitcoin, it's pretty much every asset class is in this um, euphoric light cycle type of phase. 
Moving on, page 11. There are many technical patterns such as the sideways triangle, also known as a wedge or pennant. Sideways patterns are usually highlighted by a defined breakout and the start of a new uptrend or downtrend. Um, even more popular, and I don't actually have in this report, or even perhaps um, more significant, is the head and shoulders pattern. But if you do any kind of search, Google search for technical analysis and technical analysis patterns, you'll see there's, there's endless amounts, cup and handle, there's all these different types of things um, that chartists use to kind of help skew the probabilities in their favor. And probabilities is really important to understand here. None of these, these patterns or none of this chart formation is a guarantee. It just helps skew the probabilities of where things may or may not go more in your favor. It helps take some of the guessing away, but at the end of the day, there's still that possibility and risk that a new pattern is gonna form or um, your own bias and what you think that chart pattern is actually starting to form um, isn't true at all because you're just looking for things based on, on your own bias or, or what you're hoping will transpire in the marketplace. But technical analysis is very powerful and it does, um, it does help you and it can help you identify probabilities in a way which will allow you to make better decisions. Um, so I'm going to move past some of this because it does dive into understanding technical analysis. It gets a little wordy. I do uh, recommend that you read this, but me reading it on this video or in this audio piece, I think um, will lose a little bit of its luster simply because some of it you need to visualize, such as support and resistance. Um, so do take a moment to look at this section, page 10 and page 11, and it does continue on to page 12 where I do some um, use you know, different aspects of, of charting and, and how the current chart patterns, what we call an analog of, of a previous chart pattern to today, looks very similar to previous crash cycles. So again, this is not um, an exact science. Technical analysis can be very flawed, especially um, based on the different types of bias that we have as humans, but sometimes the correlation is a bit eerie and is uh, a warning sign that we should not take lightly. So moving past this technical analysis section, which is more or less page 10 through 12, um, and then continues on into page 13, uh, I want to get to a very important topic because this is really, I think, the epicenter of, of cycles and the, and the appreciation for you know, the cyclical nature of markets. And if you think things do have a cyclical nature, then eventually they're going to come down the other way. One of the terms that is important to understand is reversion to the mean. Um, and this is on page 14, reversion to the mean. There is one more concept I want to introduce, which is reversion to the mean. The term mean in mathematics is simply the arithmetic average. Add up each unit of measurement, divide by the total number of units, and you get the mean or average. The mean when referencing a particular market is the average price or return of that market over a specific period of time. Thus, the idea of reversion to the mean implies that when a current trend or set of data deviates from historic averages, it should eventually return to a level that is closer to the mean. The statistic known as standard deviation is a measurement used to summarize the amount by which certain values vary or stray away from the averages within a broader set of data. When being applied to investing, a larger standard deviation may suggest the greater likelihood that reversion to the mean will soon occur. So basically, if you have an average um, where that line is, is going vertical or declining or however the, the numbers plot themselves out, when you then take the, aver the mean and you look at what the current price um, action or the, or the current price pattern is doing, oftentimes you'll see in these, in these bubble type markets where price is so well above the average or the mean that it, it, it's clear that an eventual falling back to earth is forthcoming or a reversion to the mean. And the higher things get, or the more ridiculous things get, that can be measured by what is called standard deviation. So the greater number of standard deviations above the mean uh, a current uh, asset or price chart is reflecting, it's more likely that you know, the eventual reversion to the mean is gonna happen and it's gonna happen in a more volatile and abrupt type of way. So this is true across, again, multiple asset classes right now, from the stock market to real estate to just about just about everything. Um, that the the pain that could be forthcoming if we see reversion to, to the mean uh, needs to be taken seriously. 
Notice in the chart on the right how abruptly markets return to the mean as the deviation from historic averages becomes more extreme. So this is a chart on page 14 that's, that's worth checking out and, and uh, soaking this in a little bit more. So to summarize, timing is everything. As previously mentioned, timing is critical. Even when things pan out as technical analysis suggests, timing can be difficult to get right. Therefore, having a long time horizon can be beneficial. It is one of the reasons we recommend preparing a strategic refinance plan in advance so you are already positioned to take advantage of forecasted outcomes before they occur. So this is really the outreach, the cry to the public we have right now. You need to get prepared. You need to have a plan in place regardless of what the outcome is. If interest rates don't go down, if the market stabilizes and stocks keep going up, what's your plan for that? How are you going to be prepared to take advantage of that? Most importantly, based on what we see in the forecast that we have put together and shared with our clients, we see tougher times ahead, and although that's good for mortgage rates, it may not be good for house prices or home prices. So uh, doing a balancing act between whether or not you'll be able to take advantage of lower mortgage rates due to where your home value is, is something you need to keep in mind. Generally speaking though, with the potential for much lower mortgage interest rates, you want to be in a position to take advantage of that before it happens. Interest rates change every single day, and the types of things that influence mortgage interest rates can make the opportunity to get the best rate, the lowest rate, with the least amount of cost, as uh, um, create the opportunity to uh, obtain that type of interest rate, giving you a very thin margin to do so. Maybe, maybe that all-time record low rate with the least amount of closing costs is a one-day opportunity. By the time you hear about it, it's going to be long gone. So we encourage you to reach out to us, send me an email, leave a comment below, uh, get in touch with us however you need to so that we can spend some time talking about where we see the market going, how you can be prepared for it, regardless of where you currently are now, either as a current homeowner or looking to buy in the future, or if you're an experienced and savvy real estate investor, now's not the time to take the current situation lightly and hang back and be reactionary. You need to be proactive in these current market conditions. So thanks for listening to this. Hopefully you took something away from it. Um, putting this video together, putting the audio together and eventually sharing that in uh, one of my podcasts. Um, hopefully through one of these formats, you, you give yourself an opportunity to soak this information in multiple times. Become familiar with it. You don't need to become an expert, but the little bit you gain here or there by the more you listen to it, it'll make our conversations more productive, more fluid, and will allow you to understand our recommendations and the other things that are going on around you so you can be better prepared. So thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you in the next video and can't wait to be in touch and, and hear from you so we can help you prosper in 2019. Talk to you soon.